It feels like I'm coming in from the cold in a way. Um, I got turned on to these ideas actually back in 1985 when I went to the Addictions Research Foundation in Toronto. Um, I was working in a, a methadone program at the time in Christchurch, New Zealand, and it was just really interesting uh, thinking about, you know, we're working with a whole lot of guys around change, around addiction stuff, and that got me really interested in thinking about how we apply these ideas into an area that's passionate to me, which is around family violence. Because I think that's the last bastion of um, equality between the genders. And uh, I, I don't know if you heard the news this morning, um, but the amount of abuse of women in mental health facilities uh, is appalling. We think that actually 1.6 million Australian women are on the receiving end of violence. We know that um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait women are eight times more likely to be abused by their partners. In our country, Māori women are twice as likely to be abused by their partners. We think the base rates are around about 10% across the population. So this is not an issue that's uh, one to take lightly. And of course, um, it's a challenge to us about how do we sit in a room with somebody and actually do the hard yards of motivational work. Because at the end of the day, I don't know about you, but, but my work is about making sure that when we're in the room, we're doing the work. And so I've got to really be careful about my writing reflex because I'm pretty passionate. But how do I invite a man to sit and explore and make sense of his behaviour and how he's joined in maybe with that dominant male narrative of violence against women? And how do we actually create a mission of safety? So I want to catch you up today around some of my kind of thinking. Um, but, so we need to talk about Dave. Um, Dave separated from his partner. Um, and came back to the house three days afterwards after separating the soldier's ex-partner. There's a story behind this. There's a story behind There's always stories behind this stuff. So David separated from his partner prior to the assault. He came back to the house to pick up some gear, saw his best mate's truck up the driveway, went into the house, found his best mate and his ex-partner in bed together, went out to his truck, grabbed a monkey wrench, one of those big ones, he's a builder, walked into the house, assaulted both of them seriously and was charged with um, aggravated assault and did a short prison sentence um, before heading my way. Now, let's think for a moment about Dave's conversations. He's got a lot going on inside his head and he's got a lot of conversations happening in prison with his cellmates. So let's think for a moment what's going on in his head and the conversations he's having externally which may well reinforce the conversation he's having in his head. Let's think about that. So he's, he's thinking, that bitch, you can't trust women. You turn your back and what do you get? He's thinking about uh, his best mate. What a prick. You can't trust blokes either. I thought he was a mate. How do you do that to a mate? And the response he gets from telling a story from others, oh, mate, no way. Oh, you've got to show him. Man, you did good. I wouldn't put up with that shit either. Back to Dave. They deserve what they get. I'd do it again. And now I'm the one who's being blamed for doing the stuff. I'm the one who's got to go and see that Ken guy. What a waste of space that's going to be. He probably won't listen to me anyway. He'll take the other side of the story. So when Dave turns up to see me, intoxicated with his feelings and sense of injustice, that he's the victim here, my job is to invite Dave to take a different position and to explore the reasons why he's sitting with me, and to try and create a sense of safety. This relationship's over with his ex-partner, Karen, and, of course, with his best and our ex-mate as well. But how do I sit with Dave in the room and try and get him to make sense of what's happening, to make sense of what he's done? Because Dave will no doubt go on to another relationship, and he's going to go on to another relationship. So if he just slides in to be with me, he does his time, and doesn't do change, then we're actually creating risk. Now we also know that women are more likely to head back to a man who comes and does a piece of intervention work. Women are seven times more likely to go back into a relationship. So they have hopes, they have hopes of safety. They have hopes that actually someone like me will actually do the hard yards. That actually Dave's of this world will be safer when they go back home. So we have a kind of ethical responsibility to try and get this right. 
So if we think about you know, the new process of email, I'm not going to talk, I'm really into this idea of engaging. How, how do I get Dave to sit with me? And uh, we often talk about the writing reflex. Now, I think Dave's writing reflex is happening long before he gets to me. He's got his going on and I've got mine going on. So if I have more investment in Dave changing than he does, then he's more likely to argue against my ideas. He's more likely to become more um, convinced, either out loud or in his head. He's more likely to disengage. He's more likely then to become more entrenched with his existing position. If I bully Dave, which often happens in my field of practice, I've seen some awful practice. If I bully him, um, I'm just replicating the same bullying behaviour that he's done with Karen, his ex-partner. And how can I model abusive practice to stop abusive practice? That becomes anathema. If we accept that a significant amount of change happens in relationship, then the relationship I model with Dave and, and how we affiliate with each other, how we actually make that connection, even from a brain state perspective, becomes pretty interesting. So my challenge in those first few moments, like any good MI work, is to form a connection, to begin to build that working alliance and find a way for Dave and myself to sit in this room together. So our starting agendas may be different, but I think there's probably more in common than uh, we have. Difference. Now let's think about what violence does to Dave. Dave's become what I call disconnected. He's become dismembered. He's become disconnected from the relationships that are, have been important to him with Karen and uh, with Karen's children. He's a stepdad in this situation. But I think there's some things around thinking about how we engage around this idea of accountability. So I feel a sense of accountability to safety in, a, in, in the immediate sense of the word, but also in an ongoing way. I also feel there's a sense of how do we get Dave to think about living a pro-social life, which is actually about thinking about the impact of his behaviour on others. That's the longer term kind of thing we're doing. But also think from a MI perspective, how do we actually bring those other voices into the room? Because I think motivation actually is not just about the individual. We're often motivated in relationship to our relationships with others. We often connect our hopes, our hopes, if we can join our hopes with the hopes of others, then that becomes a much more powerful place to stand. So we don't walk this journey in isolation, we, we walk this journey with a sense of connection. My connection with Dave to walk alongside him, but also finding other allies in his life to make this possible. Now, of course, my work from an MI perspective is thinking about what position will Dave take in relationship to this whole notion of abusive practice within his life. Because he's been pretty doing this for a long time. This isn't a one-off situation. I can certainly understand the distress of separation. It's not easy. I can certainly understand Dave's distress in that acute moment when he finds his partner in bed with his best mate. He hasn't just been rejected once. He's been done over twice. So I can understand that. And of course, how do I sit with him in a way of understanding this isn't OK for him. This is hurtful, this is painful, this is distressing. But what he did is not OK as a way of responding. So in MI is directional. The practice is directional. So my role is to get through that first interview with the whole notion, hopefully, that Dave might come back. Isn't that what we're trying to do, to get him to come back? Because so easily discord can just walk into the room and uh, that can create a, a position of, of resistance towards change. But let's think about this process for Dave. Now, I mentioned the number of conversations Dave ha has had with himself and his own head, the number of conversations that he's had with his cellmates, the number of conversations he has now had time to replicate and weave. My conversation has to be different. And so we all know that argumentation at this point will get us nowhere. So the first thing I need to do is to probably do lots of reflections because it's almost like the hotter Dave is at this moment in time when he walks in the door, the quieter I need to be, the more reflective I need to be, and the more calm I need to be in the inside. I need to listen to this man and help him wonder uh, where he's going next. Dave will invite me through his sustained talk, of course, to join him in his position, his position of injustice, that uh, he's the one who's the victim here. But it's interesting because I think Dave, actually part of Dave will also have some change talk operating because when you sit in prison for a while, 
You have lots of downtime. You have lots of time to think about stuff. You have lots of time to reflect. And Dave's got lots of time to reflect on things. And one of the things that's really interesting that came out of this conversation with Dave was when I started to think about what he thought it was like for the children in this event, because they were home. They were privy to what happened on this day between Dave, his ex-partner, and his ex-mate. So how do we um, avoid argumentation with Dave, but sit with him in his distress? Because I want Dave to start to appreciate that actually he's not the only voice in this room. In fact, how do we create a space that allows Dave to begin to think about the perspectives of other people and about how that might be in his best interest to join with the hopes of others, his dad, Karen, and his stepdaughter. So how do we actually, how do I invite Dave to actually think about this from an MI perspective? And, and I, I use a notion that uh, comes out of narrative work called internalise other. Because I'm interested in Dave beginning to think about what it might be like, what hopes others might have for him. Now, of course, to go straight to Karen, he's pretty hurt about that, so that's not a good place to start. But I might start with a conversation around, so Dave, your dad, what might his hopes for his son be? What would he hope you, that you would do when you come and see me? What, what would he like to see his boy doing differently as a result of actually spending this time, <coughs> you spending this time with me? So we can start, begin a conversation of evoking some connections for Dave, because as I said, Dave is dismembered at the point he comes to me. He's quite disconnected, he's quite isolated. Now we all know in this room, you and I know very well, that when someone's in an isolated state, they're often in a more risky state. Because what do you do when you're isolated and you're in your own head a lot of the time? You tend to ruminate, you tend to go around, you tend to think, who's she with now? And you tend to do the drive-bys. We know about those breach of safety orders and protection orders and police safety orders and so forth. But also the risk for Dave, he'll then start to drink more. And at that moment, of course, as we heard this morning from David, where he's likely to then um, get into some impulsive behaviour, he's likely to text, he's likely to do drive-bys, likely to go around, and uh, we know what's likely to happen. Now, it's kind of interesting thinking about this idea because, again, my voice becomes less in this jigsaw. But, again, also I want to connect Dave with the experiences of others because I think many other men have walked a path ahead of him. Because I don't think Dave is unusual. I think Dave, in some ways, is living up to some expectations of masculinity that men should dominate women. It's an old story, isn't it? It's an old story. Plato and Aristotle told us that story. They extolled the virtues of the public world over the private world and said the, that the public world occupied by men was much more important than the private world occupied by women and servants and children. So this is a long tale. In fact, we have um, we encapsulated those ideas. In our country, rape with a marriage wasn't outlawed until 1985. So men had entitlement to sexual favours from partners. So it's interesting, isn't it? These are, these are, that's not long ago. That's in my lifetime of actually working as a professional in this area. But I'm interested in this idea also around other stories of other men that might be helpful to Dave. So I see some of my MI work as being able to be a translator of other stories, of other ideas, of other men that have actually walked ahead of Dave. Now, of course, when we get Dave into a group context, we do have this idea that there'll be people in different positions around change. So let's think about these ideas about coming into the room. Because I'm interested in some questions, like, this is going to tell me, MI is about asking open questions, right? It's also about lots of reflections, but I'm interested in some questions that I think are useful for Dave. I'm interested in Dave's effort to getting to see me. What evidence has, has he made? These are just my favourite kind of questions that I'll pop, um, pepper with an initial conversation. That will tell me a lot about motivation, the efforts he's made to actually walk in the door, to get himself there on time, to be present, because as you can imagine, this is a pretty stressful place for Dave because he's wondering about, he's watching me intently. He's wondering how I'm going to react to him. He's wondering about um, what position I'll take in relation to him. Will I be judging him? He's very mindful of that. And of course, I can lose this relationship very, very quickly. Very quickly. I'm the one who can muck it up for, for long before he can. But as Dave walks into that room, you can almost feel the potential for discord dripping off the ceiling, right? It's, uh, it's that notion that uh, this is, a, this is a, 
This is, a, this is like a, we, are, we are certainly not dancing at this point in terms of EMI terms. We are, we are working hard. But I'm interested in this idea here. I want to ask Dave what he was thinking about what this might be like. What's this going to be like to come and see someone like me and talk about the conditions, situation of when you're arrested? I want to know that. I want him to, to help me understand what he was thinking on the way to come and see me. Because I think that's useful. It's a useful question. Because, again, that's going to render the invisible visible. It's going to render what's in his head, hopefully, on the table. It's going to get him, hopefully, thinking about being honest with me. And, of course, that's what I might, an honest relationship. I don't care what Dave says to me. He can say, I think you're a wanker, Ken. I think you're a dick. I don't care about that because I care about safety and families. But I'd rather he said that rather than thought it and left it unspoken. I want him to be as honest as I can, and I want to affirm that honesty. So, Dave, you're a man that actually can have your own voice. That's fantastic. I look forward to actually hearing more of that in our work together. So in those reflections, we can reflect those moments. I'm also interested in this idea about safety. For Dave, safety is how, what, what does he need for this to be a safe place? He's demonstrated in his life that he cannot be safe with others. So what do I need to do to make this a safe place for us to do our talking? To be able to talk about abusive practice, to be able to actually have those conversations. And I want him to talk about his internalised experience, because most of the men I work with know violence from the inside. So I want to know, actually, about um, how, I, how willing is he to share his experience with me, to let me know about where he learnt this stuff from. Because in that place, we can then actually put some injunctions in place. We can ask him to take a position of resistance rather than complicity with male power and violence against women. I'm interested in how important it is for him to learn the skills. I'm interested in how confident he is. All the, all the same in my questions, but I mentioned this last one. How ready are you, Dave? to do this work, this work of actually creating safety within, family, within families, uh, your future family, your future relationships. So this, that's where we want to start. We want to open the space for a conversation because unless Dave steps in the room, if he is emotionally and physically or, or spiritually outside the room, then we can't do the work. But we're in the room together. How do we make that really count? Thank you very much indeed.